as you know, we're going through our theological, we're going through our theological studies. In our theological studies, and this is a part of the series of beginner's discipleship, so don't let that word beginner fool you and make you miss out a lot of good learning. Amen? Your pastor here still learns a lot of good stuff from even so-called basics. Quite often I think that we have to major more in basics rather than find something new out there to teach something deeply, if that made any sense yeah. to you. If we majored more and got deeper and studied more into basics, our practical living and the main doctrines or basic doctrines we read from the Bible connect more to deeper concepts and it'll help us more in our lives. So I want to stress that. But within theological studies, there are several branches. Theology proper, the study of God. Christology, the study of Christ. Eschatology, the study of last times. And we've been going through a lot on Christianology, if there is such a term, which is the study of Christians. But today what we're going to be covering is ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is the study of the church. And you guessed it, today we'll be talking about, from that screen, church, the church. A lot of people who watch stuff online, even deep doctrines, don't know this very basic needful teaching, unfortunately. They don't know what a church is. They think that a church is you don't have to attend a meeting with a bunch of believers inside a building. Or they think that the church is a building. These are incorrect concepts. And the reason why is because they only have partial truths of what they understand a church to be. Believe it or not, a church can refer to a building and a church can refer to a universal aspect where you don't have to meet each other in a local area. So there are partial truths to this, but it is such an amateurish partial knowledge of it. So that shows that they don't know completely this basic doctrine and they need to go back to the basics. Church, we're going to start off with defining it, obviously. If we define it first, then uh, we'll understand it better. Now, the definition of the church is as follows here. The word church, which is an English word, but originally English words, as you know, it would come from Latin and then it would come from Greek, Gothic, and other words. So church didn't just come out like that. It came from other languages. So church did come from a Greek word, which is kuriakon. And that means the Lord's house or belonging to the Lord. The more common word that we see the word church from, which you will hear uh, quite a number of people talk about, is a called out assembly. So we see right here, assembly. It is a called out assembly. In other words, where a group of people, they are called out by God, or they are called out by some other person. They are set aside and they assemble together. So it is a called out assembly, which comes from the word ecclesia, ecclesia or kuriakon. Those are the two words. It's ecclesia and kuriakon. Uh, I don't see the Greek word here, so let me write it out for you. Ecle, I think it was, yeah, there we go. Okay, so it's ecclesia, okay? I, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, all right, in English wording. <laughs> so, ecclesia, and then right here, kuriakon, if my Greek is correct. I'm just going back 10 years on my Greek alphabet here. So <laughs> you have to know this stuff if you want to go on par against the Greek and Hebrew scholars, right? So there's a reason why at PBI I had to learn Greek and Hebrew, which was very useful to me. So I knew enough where I can tackle them. But anyways, returning to our main point, 
We see the Greek origins of this English word, ecclesia, called out assembly, kuriakon, belonging to the Lord. Now, when you look at Acts chapter 19, there's a rarer definition as well, a rarer definition. If we look at Acts chapter 19, notice what the King James Bible translators wrote right here. In, the, in Acts chapter 19, notice in verse 37, verse 37, for ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Now, notice that in verse 37, it says robbers of churches, right? Church, it is important to understand, some people don't know this, but the word church is not just something from a Greek word. Church is obviously more of an English word, right? Uh, not this one. Church is obviously more of an English word. So we have to be looking at the English definition more than Greek. Now let me repeat that again. We have to look at the English definition more than Greek. It is true, like I told you before, the word church, that English word, came from originally Greek words or Gothic or Latin. So I've explained that to you. But we have to also understand this doesn't mean that we dismiss the English definition. Now, why do I emphasize that? Because Greek scholars concentrate only on Greek words. So then because of that, they claim that your King James Bible, when it says churches here, that's a wrong translation. Because the Greek word, we're going to come, we're going to look at it, it does not support the idea of a called out assembly or belonging to the Lord in that sense, in the Greek sense. So because of that, they argue right here, this is referring to a sacred building. That's what they're going to say in Acts 19.37. But if they looked up the English definition itself, it already told you it's a house consecrated. So it already told you it means a sacred place. So when the KJB translators... Remember, they were writing not a Greek word here. They were writing an English word here. If they wrote church here, which is an English word, and the English definition is sacred place, what's wrong with that? Now, if they wrote their called out assembly, then the scholars have a right to get upset, right? If they wrote down their belonging to the Lord, then the scholars have the right to get upset. But because they wrote here church, which means a sacred place, then they have no right to say that the KJV translators were incorrect in their translation. Do we follow so far? So let's look at the Greek word that they define. So this is Webster's 1828 dictionary. So we saw the English definition as proof. But now we're going to look at the Greek definition here, and when I say the Greek, I say that very loosely. I don't believe there is the Greek because there are so many uh, Greek definitions. But the word is hieron, all right? I believe that what it is is hierosulos. If you go to Acts 19.37, the supposed Greek word is hierosulos, which means desecrators of temples. It could also mean committing sacrilegious or it could mean destroyers of temples. You could say robbers of temples, whatever. But the idea is it comes from that Greek word hieron, which is temple, okay? So this is the Greek word right here. That's why modern Bible version translators, they're going to translate not churches there, they're going to put temples there. But if you look up hieron, notice right here it means what? It means sacred. It also means building. See these root words? It doesn't only mean temple. Temple is inclusive in sacred places, but that's not the only definition. Also, if you go to Thayer or Thayer, however way you want to pronounce his name, I could care less, okay? I don't really respect Greek scholars, sorry. But Thayer's definition, notice right here, sacred place. See that? Temple is inclusive in that one. 
Greek scholars, they just assume temple, and the reason why they do that is because sacred places commonly during those days were temples, right? So that's the reason why they just rush the word temple in there. But if we go to the root words, it means sacred place. So why doesn't church qualify for that? When we saw the English definition is a sacred place. But not only that, if we were to look at even the word temple itself, which they didn't really pay much attention to, Eastern Orthodox, which is where you get a lot of your Greek translation, right? Or manuscripts. So here's even from Wikipedia itself, believe it or not. They even recognize this. But we see here from the Greeks themselves in Orthodox Christianity, they point out that the principal words used for houses of worship, see sacred places where they meet together and worship, are temple and church. The use of the word temple comes from the need to distinguish a building of the church versus the church seen as the body of Christ. So they're trying to distinguish, notice right here, a what? Of the church versus the ecclesia right here they're talking about, the called out assembly. That's what they mean right here. Notice right here, temple is used to refer to the church building as a temple of God. The words church and temple in this case are interchangeable. However, the term church, ancient Greek, ecclesia, see that? Is far more common. Yes. If you look at the entirety of the New Testament, ecclesia, ecclesia, ecclesia. You don't see hierosolos. That's only one time, Acts 19.37. It shows the rarity of it. But these translators were so honest and they looked at every possible aspect of the translation that they realized that there are those rare moments church can be translated as a sacred place or building. Why? Because they're being cumulative. They're being holistic of everything in translation. They're not just picking what's the more natural way to translate. See, if you pick a mostly the most natural way to translate, then what are you going to do about those rare moments? Then it shows right here you're not being inclusive, you're not being holistic or completely honest in your translation. Then this points out how the KJV translators are superior to our modern translators. The modern translators, they're just translating up by what's most, more common to them. So church is called out assembly, so this is incorrect to them. But the KJV translators, the reason why they're so superior is they see it as basically, yes, it's more common. Church is called out assembly. But if I'm going to give you the complete English definition and etymology with temple and church being interchangeable, I'm going to mention this rare moment as well, sacred place. So it shows the superiority of these translators. As a matter of fact, Catholicism and even Protestantism, they point out right here that they use that word temple or church as sacred place. They see the connections with those. They refer to their churches as temples, believe it or not. See how these words can be interchangeable. Anyway, you can look it up. That's the word temple in Wikipedia. So they even recognize this. So that's pretty common. If we scroll down here from Smith's uh, Bible Dictionary, it gives uh, more uh, simplistic meanings and more clarity than the other dictionary that I showed you before. But it points out Greek kuriakon, belonging to the Lord. And then also it points out right here, ecclesia. So those are the two most common terms for the church. Let's see right here. I think they mentioned, let me see. There was an, I think there was another important note. I don't think so. Yeah, okay, never mind. I thought there was another important note here. 
Okay, we've seen now the definition of church. It is ecclesia, it is kuriakon, but don't forget it can refer to sacred place. That is very important to understand. It can refer to sacred place. Let's see here. But even, uh, I believe, uh, uh, forget that. We looked at enough here. Hieros, we looked at everything. Okay, we're done. <laughs> we're going to now look at the references of the church. Go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. We're going to look at the references of the church. We looked at the origins of the church, all right? We looked at the origins of the church. That's what we covered. Now we're going to look at the references of the church. This is important because church is not that simplistic as you think. This is where everybody mess up in their, def uh, in their definitions for church. They think that church is, I don't need to meet in a building, or it is a building. This is where you get all these kinds of wrong stuff in people going to churches and people who don't like going to churches online. So we're going to look at references of the church. The common one, which we already covered, Acts chapter 7, verse 37 to 38. Notice it's an assembly called out by God. It's not just a Christian distinction. It's important to understand. It's not something solely Christian. It can be even any called out assembly. Look at Acts chapter 7, verse 37. The Bible says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the what? Church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai. Obviously, the Christians didn't exist that time. So these Jews were called out by God at Mount Sinai. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. The second reference is, believe it or not, a building. A building. You'll see at times that the Bible refers to the church as a place, a location, or a building. The second verse that you can write down, which we looked at it before already, was Acts chapter 19, verse 37. Remember that? So Acts 19, 37. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18. The Bible says, For first of all, when he come together in the where? See that? They're meeting together in a place. I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Now, in Acts chapter 19, verse 37, which you wrote down, here's the part that I forgot to mention. This is the important part, when you go back to Acts 19, 37. A very important thing to remember about the church Let's see, uh, where's that definition? Just, boom, disappeared. Okay, forget it, forget it. Uh, no, it's not public worship. I just uh, lost it. It was hieros, but I deleted that, so forget it now. <laughs> okay. If we look at Acts 19.37, the verse pointed out uh, robbers of churches, which is hierosolos. You look up that Strong's Concordant definition, or Thayer's Greek lexicon. They admitted it was referring to sacred place, correct? Remember that? But I don't know if you noticed it or caught it. They mention sacred place that is connected to the one true God, God himself. Now, why is that important? The reason why that's important is that Acts 19.37 it could be referring when it says churches, and scholars are saying that, well, pagans never had churches that time. How do you not know it was referring to those Christians who were meeting together in a sacred place, in a location, in a building? Have they ever thought about that? The reason why that definition is true is because 
Like I told you before, that word, when you look up hieros or hieron, they mention it's a temple or sacred place committed to the one true God. Most of the times you see that Greek definition, hieros or hieron, you know what it's mostly referring to? The one true God that people are meeting at a sacred place. So, how do you not know that robbers of churches, which scholars assume, this is referring to pagans meeting together in temples. No, you could be wrong. It could be referring to Christians meeting together in a church building. What's the evidence? The evidence is this, is that it says robbers of churches, plural, right? Nor yet blasphemers of your goddess, Diana. Do you know how many temples they had for Diana? One. They didn't have multiple temples. But Christians did. Here's another thing. Another thing to keep in mind is when you look at verse 27, verse 27, the context already told you that it's only one temple of Diana, not multiple. Another thing is look it up yourself. There's only one temple of Diana. I don't think the temple had a church split. And then the other priest said, I'm going to park another temple down here, like five miles down the road, and call it the real temple of Diana Baptist Church. <laughs> the real worship. And co-pastor Max, you know, from the church split. <laughs> now, another evidence is Acts 20 itself, the very next chapter. Remember, this happened with the Ephesians. This happened with the Ephesians. The town's clerk or the speaker said, Paul is not a robber of churches. He's trying to appease the whole mass here. That Paul is not the type where he runs a church and robs the people there. Now the evidence is Acts 20. Paul is speaking to the Ephesians and he may note, he emphasized, you know me, I don't try to make money off of you or rob money from you. He said that to those Ephesians in those churches. Go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Notice what Paul said the very next chapter to the Ephesians. He points out in verse 33, verse 33, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Why would Paul emphasize that to the Ephesians unless he recalled what happened with that Ephesus riot where they were accusing him of robbing money from churches? Doesn't that make more sense? All right, now let's uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And then we'll look at verse 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 32. Another reference to the church, which is common that people online want to emphasize, is a universal aspect. In other words, all saved believers. 1 Corinthians 10, 32. The Bible says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles, nor to the what? Church of, Church of God. So notice right here that the Church of God is referring to those that are all saved believers. Hence, you see the distinction here, right? You see the distinction of church where they talk about universal and local. We're looking right now at 1 Corinthians 10, 32, universal church. That's why Catholicism was born. Catholicism was born because before the pagan Catholic Church, it was universal. So believers realized that even though they had different locations of churches around the world, they were all universal. So then they got together. But what happened was you creep in a little wrong doctrine, then you compromise with the politicians and pagans, kind of like what they're doing now. And that's why the monstrosity of the Catholic Church was born. See that? 
So believe it or not, we're originally Catholic Church, believe it or not. We were really, historically speaking, Catholic Church in a non-Catholic, non-pagan way. But then, because of those Roman Catholics who kept compromising with politicians, the Roman emperors, the pagans, and then creeping in wrong doctrine, that's how the monstrosity was born. And in, this is a fair warning. No matter what church you start, give it enough time, it will end up in apostasy, including ours, if Jesus don't come sooner. Oh, he starts in with creeping in wrong doctrines here and there. Then you compromise with the politicians and then the rulers out there. That's why we're very separatist. That's why it's important we're independent, fundamental Baptists. See, we're fundamentalists. In other words, they believe separation from the world. We emphasize that strongly because we don't want to repeat our history, our mistakes. That's important to understand. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times that you'll have to uh, make dealings with the world. That does happen. That's just real life. But you have to have a limit. You have to have a boundary. If you don't have that, then nothing is going to stop you from becoming Roman Catholic. Look at the machine right now, the Roman Catholic machine. They are the most ecumenical bunch ever. More than any other religion, pretty much. That's why they get along well with Masons, and they have secret clubs. Now, I know that they'll out the publicly speak against Masonry, but you go to the people who are involved in those secret organizations, and then you'll see that the people who hang around Knights of Malta, Knights of Columbus, and other Catholic organizations, they hang around with Scottish Freemasonry and other Masons out there. How do you think the Catholic Church... Uh, Shut up. All right, just keep teaching. Okay, all right. <laughs> then I'm going to give you a whole lecture on yeah. world history of Catholic conspiracies, right? Y'all don't want to hear that. Obviously, people online don't want to hear that, right, about all those conspiracies. Okay, so <laughs> that's a joke. All right, Ephesians 1, 22. Ephesians 1, 22. Fourth reference is body of Christ, body of Christ. So church is referring to every say believer. But we also have to remember when the Bible, whenever the Bible says the body of Jesus, the body of Jesus, it can refer to those saved Christians, all say believers. So it's important to understand whenever the Bible talks about the church within the context of all say believers and uses the word body of Jesus Christ, you have to remember that. That's another different name for it. We look at Ephesians 1.22. And hath put all things under his feet, Jesus Christ's feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his what? Body. So you got to remember that. The church can refer to the body of Christ. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. So Baptist briders are wrong. Now, when you go to an independent Baptist church, even those connected with Jack Hiles, you have to be very wary. A lot of them are Baptist brider. Uh, I don't want to name names, but including some of the famous ones over here, they could be Baptist briders, so you have to watch out for them. Baptist brider, it is a... Baptist briders, they teach a heresy that only the Baptist denomination is the body of Christ. Hogwash. How many Catholics have you led to Jesus Christ? Or even Buddhists or Hindus. And they just hang around, unfortunately, with that culture, that family crowd, because they just don't know any better. But they get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't attend your Baptist church and Baptist denomination. So then what? They're not the body of Christ then? They're not considered to be the church. No, the church or the body of Christ is not just a Baptist denomination. It's every say believer. And I am Baptist as you can get. I emphasize that so strongly like I did just now. We're separatists. We're Baptist by denomination. But I ain't going to teach a wrong doctrine by saying that every say believer in Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Episcopalian, or a, I don't care if it's Catholic denomination, that these people are not the body of Jesus Christ. That's heresy. That's heresy. No matter what you are, you are part of the body of Jesus Christ. Now we go to Acts chapter 20, verse 17. There's another extreme to that one. That, oh, so it's not referring 
to a local church. No, church can refer to local. So in a local area where you meet together, that is defined as a church. And to be quite honest, sadly, that should be emphasized more today because a lot of people are just locked up in their bedrooms and uh, the TV is their idol, the computer screen is their idol. They just use the rationale that I'm watching something biblical. I'm watching a preacher. And because of that, they argue vehemently against attending a local church. Why? Because they only concentrate on apostate churches, <laughs> even apostate Baptist churches. What about Bible-believing churches, Bible-believing Baptist churches? You should attend those. I'm not encouraging you to attend some kind of full-swing apostate church, but I'm telling you that you got to attend a Bible-believing Baptist church, a local church. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the what? Church. Do you think that meant he called every single elder or pastor around the world? That obviously meant from Miletus to Ephesus, that location, that area. So it's not universal, it's local area. Another two more verses you want to write down are 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. And this person already wrote it out for you. You'll notice that it's the church of Corinth, all right, or even churches. You'll see some of those verses from Paul. And then also another verse that you want to write down is 1 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. 1 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. When it says churches, I don't think it means multiple bodies of Jesus. See that? So you have to understand there is a local aspect to that as well. A local aspect to that. Now go to Matthew 16.18. Matthew 16.18. Sixth reference is a spiritual building. It is a spiritual building. So no, I am not talking about a spiritual body of Jesus Christ. The Bible recognizes church to be a building itself, but not just physically, but even spiritually speaking. See that? So the definition church does have some meaning to a place, some sacred place, sacred building. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. The Bible says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what did he say? I will build my church. Why would he say that this church can be built upon unless he refers it in a building context? Now, obviously, this is not physical. We know this is spiritual. So he sees spiritual buildings here. Another one is uh, Ephesians 2.19. Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll look at verse 19. Notice that the church is in reference to a spiritual building. Now, can you already see why there's so much wrong doctrines online or in other churches with this misunderstanding about the church? That's why these concepts are very helpful to you. No, they're not basic. They're helping you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built, see that? Building upon the what? Foundation. A building has a foundation. That matches with Matthew 16, right? Of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the foundation. Then the apostles follow along. Then in whom all the what? Building. See that? And notice temple is in there. Do you see that in verse 21? See, there is a connection with temple and church concerning building wise. And then you'll notice verse 22, build it and habitation. So God sees a spiritual building here in reference to these saved believers. And that's a church, remember that? Saved believers is a church. The last one is Bride of Christ. Go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, Bride of Christ. Mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists and Baptist briders get this doctrine wrong. So the Mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists do not think that the Christian church is the Bride of Jesus Christ. 
They think that they Judaize everything, okay? So they'll say that the bride is reference to something Jewish or something else out there. Mad Acts always come up with new stuff, believe it or not, as they uh, dispensationalize more and more. So that's why they're very hyper. Baptist briders get it wrong because they think it's only a Baptist denomination. But that's not true. This is all saved Christians who are known as the bride of Christ. The Christian church is the bride of Christ. Ephesians 5, 31. The Bible says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his what? Wife. All right. Husband and wife. Verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning what? The author is saying, when I'm talking about a husband and a wife, I'm talking about Christ and the church. That should be plain enough. All right. Now we go to the purpose of, uh, excuse me, uh, not the purpose of the church. Now we're going to go through the distinctions of church. The distinctions of church. We've seen right here that the church is referenced to many, many things. Now we're going to go to the distinctions. The distinctions of this church, which a lot of people don't uh, keep in mind, we see right here, a rough sketch of a church here, okay? I have to draw this like what, a couple seconds, so that's the reason why, all right? <laughs> There's always a double aspect to this because we saw the references earlier, right? There are many different references, but you notice it's like divided to two aspects mostly. It's divided to two aspects mostly. The one distinction you want to keep in mind is the invisible church and the visible church. Invisible church and a visible church. So we see visibly a church. And that is obviously in reference to Christians who are members. When your eye sees it, you see members here. That's the visible church. But guess what? There is obviously an invisible church, which is referring to all saved Christians everywhere. We don't see all the Christians around the world. Because we don't see all of them, it's invisible to us. Because that's invisible to us, but the, we already looked at the references of the church, right? All safe Christians are defined as church, correct? Yeah. Hence, what we invisibly see can also be defined as a church. And you'll see these terms are important because you're going to see a lot of times old-time preachers or theologians use these concepts. That's why it's important to know these concepts. When you see invisible church, visible church, you're going to go, what does that mean? What they mean by that is visible church is members in a church that you see. Invisible is all saved Christians everywhere. Why? Because this is within a spiritual aspect. Within a spiritual plane, we know that there is a church, all saved believers. But this one is a physical plane. Hence, that's why there is visibility. The other one is local church and universal church, which we already saw earlier, right? So a local church, which we saw earlier, is referring to a localized area or context. A universal church is not just one area. It is referring to the entire area or every place, every location. That's the universal church. Didn't you know that we are the real Catholic church? Not the Catholic church over there by denomination, you see. You know why? Because they're not saved by their seven sacraments. We're saved. So every saved believer is a genuine Catholic. When you witness to a Catholic, I'm a Catholic, you can tell them this. Actually, I'm a real Catholic. You want me to tell you how to be a real Catholic? 
The other one is actual church and ideal church. Now, everyone who's listening online want to hear this one. You know why? Because this is your excuse why you don't want to attend a church, because you don't know these distinctions. An ideal, uh, an actual church is those who are imperfect. You go to church, and then you see sister so-and-so fighting with another sister so-and-so. Brother so-and-so says this kind of stupid stuff, all right? And then you see members who don't come to church faithfully, and you wonder why, and then you get discouraged, and then you kind of beat them over the head, you judge harshly, because as you walk more in your spiritual walk, you realize that self-righteousness blinded you and you found out you have imperfections yourself. Now that's so important to understand because even if you go to a Bible-believing Baptist church, I don't care, you're going to find imperfections. You know why? That's called reality. That's called actuality. That's called actual church. Actual church. And then there's the ideal church. What is the ideal church? <laughs> the ideal one that you want. Those who are perfect. And we want that. We want a perfect church. And guess what? We ought to strive for that. See that? So just because... Everyone's a sinner and everyone's imperfect. Doesn't mean you go Calvary Chapel, you go non-denom, you go ecumenical, you become worldly, and then you never teach them right doctrine or preach hard or even uh, or go on their level and you'll always remain carnal and fleshly. You have to strive for perfection. That's a perfect or ideal church. Now, I don't care... That means then, if you see a 10,000 church, and it's a great community church, great programs for your kids and everything, guess what? That's not your ideal dream church. That's not your best life now, according to Joel Osteen. That's not the ideal church. You know what that is? That is actually actual church. In other words, so much more imperfections. You know what this church is? It is more ideal than actual compared to Joel Osteen's church. You want your dream church? You want the ideal church, a perfect church? Come to Bible-believing churches like ours. But you go to those non-denom, those huge mega churches, those aren't your ideal church. That's what your flesh thinks it is. Why? An ideal church is a perfect church, striving for perfection, not compromising with imperfections an imperfect world and remaining that way, then it will always remain an actual church or an imperfect church. See, just, we got to go back to basics, right? If everyone went back to basics, they would attend church, understand church, and not get bitter about apostate churches or, or even Bible-believing churches. They'll understand more the difference. This will help them more. And the last one is church militant and then church triumphant. Okay, what is the church militant? The church militant is referring to the church on earth, which is obviously us. We see that. So we are a militant church because we're in warfare. We're in battle. We're, uh, we're fighting against the world. So this is uh, in reference to the militant church, which is the God's church on earth. And then you get the church triumphant. What is the church triumphant? Compared to the church on the earth, the church triumphant is the one that goes to heaven. So all the say believers are up in glory land, up in heaven itself. That is church triumphant. Now, the best quote that can demonstrate this with the church militant and then the church triumphant is through Savonarola. Savonarola, when he was about to be burned by the Catholics for uh, criticizing uh, the Catholic church. Sorry about that. I had no space. 
uh, the Catholic Church, they said, I separate thee from the Church of Rome. So I separate you from the Church. A lot of people, when they got burned at the stake or got killed by the Catholic Church, it was considered to be losing your salvation as well because you were separated from... When you get separated from God's church, see, you get separated from salvation. So the Catholics told him, they put fear into him that you got separated, you just lost your salvation. I separate thee from the church of Rome. Savonarola, he said, the church militant, yes, the church triumphant, no. That was really good. That's how he went out. He went out with a bang like that. So in other words, you can separate. So he basically said, you can separate me from the church down here, but you'll never separate me from the church up there. We're going to cover uh, the purpose of the church now. And this is the most basic of all basics. And a lot of people don't know this and you ought to know it. If you don't know it, now you better know. The threefold purpose of the church. Some of you might know. Can you guess? So, the threefold purpose of the church, <clears throat> you ought to know, which is so basic, is to exalt the Savior. So they give different wordings here. Worship God in spirit and truth. So you have to think about when you come to church, are you truly exalting God? Are you worshiping in spirit, the right spirit, and is it all truth doctrinally? What will give ultimate glory to him? So look at these mega churches. You think then you're at the right church? They're not fulfilling their purpose. Then they're wasting their time on you and you're wasting your time in that church. Do you understand? If you want to go to church, you have to know the right purposes that they're giving to you. Okay. The second one is edification of the saints. Exalt the Savior, edify the saints. <clears throat> when you come to church, you're not focusing on pleasing yourself. What you're coming here for is because that brother and sister in Christ needs something, so I want to minister to them in the right way on something. And then the last one is to evangelize the sinner. In other words, you have to tell others how to get saved. You have to bring them to a Bible-believing uh, church so that they can hear the gospel or whatever. The point is, you got to make sure that they hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and they get saved, okay? So that is evangelize the sinner. So exalt the Savior, edify the saint, and uh, wait, exalt the Savior, edify the saint, and evangelize the sinner. That's the threefold purpose of the church that should be basic, that everyone should remember. Now, I'm going to give you the verses for it so you can write it down. Exalting the Savior will be Ephesians 3.21. Exalting the Savior will be Ephesians 3.21. Edifying the saint will be Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. And then evangelizing the sinner will be Acts 2, 47. Acts 2, 47. So you'll see that the church is mentioned here doing these functions. So there is scriptural support for this, and we're not just making it up with fancy terms because it rhymes and matches. Okay? Now, the last one is history of the church. The last one I want to cover is the history of the church. If we were to look at how the Lord used the church throughout history, then perhaps we would not get discouraged as easily. I'm going to show you Larkin. Larkin usually shows things historically, so we'll go from him. In this chart here, he goes through the failure of Christianity. He, it's a lot of good stuff here, actually. He went by statistics during his timeline, and he went by the official uh, research. But he pointed out right here, which is incredibly sad, how churches 
They spent uh, most of the money. He puts right here 137,400 uh, or 137 million dollars for uh, the building. And then for foreign missions is like uh, 11. It's just 11, which is pitiful. You wonder what's going on right now, right? Even more ludicrous. Anyways, the church always went through failures. That's the purpose of the chart to show you from the beginning of history to the end, Christianity has always failed. And if we were to understand that, we would not get discouraged easily, but rather be encouraged. What do you mean by that, Pastor? We get encouraged by the examples of other people before us who went through a called out assembly and they were leading such a called out assembly. So I'm not only talking about Christian church here, okay? Then what that means is let's look at every called out assembly throughout the Bible because we saw before at Acts chapter 7, remember that verse? Where Stephen talked about Moses had a church. So that's not a Christian context. What this will mean then is any called out assembly that had a leader. So this will include the Christian church. So let's look at the history of it. He starts out with Noah. Noah, you can get a lot of encouragement from about the failure of Christian churches. Now that sounds like contradictory. How can I get encouraged by a discouraging example? It's because you're going through something discouraging. So when you look at Noah's life, then you can realize I'm not the only one. And Noah did some things where I can learn from and it'll help me. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. 2 Peter 2, verse 5. And then I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter 2, and then 1 Peter chapter 3. Noah, he preached. The Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. So we see right here that he is a preacher. He is, in a sense, a pastor or a leader who preaches. But guess what? In his church, no one listened to him except seven people. Only seven people around the whole world. The whole world he preached at, and only seven would listen to him. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, the Bible says, And spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher. See that? of righteousness. Compare that with 1 Peter 3, verse 20. 1 Peter 3, verse 20. Notice, including Noah, that would be eight, which means he only had seven members. 1 Peter 3, 20, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight, souls were saved by water. How about that? I think our church is doing better. Is, isn't our church doing better? Oh, everything's so apostate. It's so wicked and, well, doing better than Noah. Doing better than Noah. Another verse, uh, there are two more verses you want to write down, which will encourage you. Genesis 5.32. Genesis 5.32. The second verse you want to write down is chapter 7, verse 6. Chapter 7, verse 6. When you look at these two verses, what you're going to notice is that Noah pastored a church for 100 years. Noah pastored a church for 100 years long. That kind of length of time of 100 years, he only had seven people. How about that? I think we're doing much better, are we not? Praise the Lord. All right, the other one is Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 1. Second person we want to look at is Abraham. Abraham. We saw Noah. Now we're going to look at Abraham just in case some people can't really see the pictures. I'm drawing these little arrows. <laughs> Maybe I'll increase it a bit more where they could see more clearly, okay. Oh, somewhat, all right. 
Now we're going to go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Notice that uh, Abraham, he was supposed to go alone, but we're going to find out that some of his family members still came along with him. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. He's supposed to go by himself, but then notice right here in verse 5, verse 5. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Notice right here, Abram did not go out by himself with Sarai. He took several people with him. So notice that Lot is included here, right? Okay, you know what he had for his church membership? He had a worldly, incestual person in the church. He had a worldly church member who committed incest. Wow, you talk about church problems, right? <laughs> That's chapter 19 and verse 35 through 36. Chapter 19, verse 35 through 36. You know that dark story where Lot, he was uh, sleeping with his daughters. It was a horrible mess there. And you'll also know from uh, reading the previous chapters that Lot, he lived such a worldly life in Sodom and Gomorrah. I think that our church is doing better, huh? Go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And then I want us to go to... Oh, what would be a good one? Exodus 32. Exodus 32. Acts chapter 7. And then we'll go to Exodus... 32, Exodus 32. Let's look at two passages right here. Moses is the third one. Moses will be the third one. You'll notice from Larkin's chart that he has the chart continuing through the Hebrew nations, the Hebrew nations, as he explains about the church, and in this sense, a called out assembly, we see the Hebrew nation functioning. Obviously then, Moses was a pastor of these Hebrews, which will be how many? He had two million members. Now you talk about every church problem that you can think of. You go to Acts chapter 7 and verse 37. We read this before. The Bible points out Moses pastored a church. Verse 37, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel... Verse 38, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. How many Jews? Well, if he took out the whole nation, that's two million members. And if you go to Exodus 32, verse 1, he had every or any church problem you can think of. So he had members who complained about the pastor's absence. That's typical, right? Oh, pastor's late, pastor's not here. Oh, we're going to die, so might as well not keep continuing the church. Might as well go back to the world. Exodus 32, 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Oh, make us gods! How about that? You can write down Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. Criticism of pastor's wife. Criticism of a pastor's wife. Oh, I don't like what the pastor's wife did because she didn't that. Oh, why did she do that? Oh, I don't like. See that there? Here's another one. People inside trying to take over your position. People in your church trying to take over your position. Well, I don't think he should be the pastor, but I can do this because if, if you were to pick me, I would. That's Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16, verse 1 through 3. Another one, lack of trust in the pastor. Lack of trust in the pastor. Well, I don't, the pastor said this, and he's, uh, he mentioned we're going to do this, but uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 2, that's lack of trust in the pastor. Another one, here's a typical church problem. You ready? 
pastor backsliding because of anger against his members. Numbers chapter 20, verse 10 through 12. Numbers chapter 20, verse 10 through 12. Sometimes you get those pastors who get impatient, who get upset at the member, who will preach a message just specifically because of those certain members. Why? Because he prayed for them, he put up with them, he put up with them for 40 years in the stinking wilderness, and those members in the wilderness still don't learn their lesson, and you get all mad, and then you disobey God, and you rush ahead of God's plan by hitting a rock. Yeah, see that? I feel encouraged, don't you? <laughs> Learning from all this, I feel encouraged. This is typical church problems. The last one, believe it or not, let's look at our greatest pastor who went through failures in the church, Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. Does that mean that Jesus Christ is a bad pastor? No. Sinless being, but he had failures in his church as well. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1. The Lord Jesus Christ and Larkin, he puts Jesus Christ right here at the end. We'll notice that there. So carries down the church all the way to Jesus Christ. Go to Matthew chapter 10 verse 1. Look at his congregation, his membership. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. You notice right here that, oh, he had about 12 people. 12 people. Oh, why is that a problem? The reason why that was a problem is when you look at Jesus' ministry when he started, he had 70. He had 70 to start with. But then later on, you'll notice right here, it drops to 12 people. Now, you talk about losing members. And you get discouraged when five families leave the church? I think Jesus did a poorer job than you. And by the way, the 12 that he had had so many church problems. You get the right-hand man who cussed and swore in front of lost people and lost his testimony. Right-hand man. That's Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 69 through 74. Verses 69 through 74. Peter, his right-hand man, cussed out, lost his testimony in front of the whole world while Jesus was at his lowest moment and needed him. Another one uh, was an infidel. John chapter 20, verse 24 through 25. John chapter 20, verse 24 through 25. His other member was an infidel. He was skeptic. He didn't believe what his pastor preached. And you get discouraged when pastor preaches a message and the members just close-minded and like this and ignore one year out the other. Hey, doubting Thomas, you get those in churches like Jesus did. Oh, if that ain't enough, one of his members was a devil, <laughs> a devil incarnate. John chapter 13, verse 29. John chapter 13, verse 29. And chapter 6, verse 70 through 71. Chapter 6, verse 70 through 71. If we can look at the history of the church, and that's what we looked at. If we can look at the history of the church, we'll realize that we're not the only one who failed or who has a failing church. As Larkin pointed out, from beginning to end, we see a failure, a failure of God's church from beginning to end time. And every pastor has experienced that, including our God Almighty himself. So let us learn from these examples and not let church problems discourage us. Amen. Father God, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to your people. Open our eyes, grow more in knowledge of the scriptures. I also pray that you'll please protect this teaching that's going out and that these people as well, and then may everything be done to further your glory and us to continually have the freedom as a church to worship you. Thank you for the doctrine of the church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.